What is up, freaks? It's your boy, Marty Ben, here to introduce this episode of Tales from the Crypt. I had the immense pleasure of sitting down with Blake Masters, an individual running for Senate out of the state of Arizona. He's coming from the private sector. He's the COO of Teal Capital and the president of the Teal Foundation. We jump into a lot of philosophical conversations about the state of America and the best path forward, everything that's going on in the country, from education border control, international geopolitics, Bitcoin, energy policy. We hit it all. Hope you guys enjoy it. This rip was brought to you by our good friends at the motherfucking Cash App. Cash App's helping you stack sats, send sats, receive sats, and sell sats, if you so please. We're saying sats, 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 because sats are the standard. There's 100 million sats in one whole Bitcoin. You don't have to buy a whole Bitcoin you do not have to buy a fraction of Bitcoin. You can stack whole sats. Instead, Cash App makes it very easy. You can DCA in the sats. That's dollar cost average. Uh, you set a set amount and you buy daily, weekly, or bi weekly. Uh, Cash App also has their boost program, which allows you to get a personalized debit card that's connected to your app and you can then go shop wherever Visa is accepted. Uh, they also have partners, uh, partner merchants, excuse me. Uh, if you go and shop with the boost card with the the particular boost for the particular merchant activated, you're going to get cash back and sometimes you even get sats back. I just saw today, I went to the coffee shop to see if there was coffee boost, no coffee boost, but I'd see 5% off, excuse me, 5% back uh, in sats at restaurants, any restaurant right now. If you haven't downloaded the cash app yet, make sure you do so. Use the code stacking sats, that's S T A C K I N G S A T S. You're going to get $10, and $10 is going to go to our good friends at Owls Lacrosse. That's Owls Lacrosse. Owls lacrosse. This rip was also brought to you by our good friends at Hoddle Hoddle. Hoddle Hoddle is here to bring you a lending platform for you freaks in the United States. This is one of the few Hoddle Hoddle products that is available to you. And the way it works is you put your Bitcoin in a two or three multi sig escrow account uh, as collateral to get stable coins as, as, a, as a form of a loan. As you're paying back, as long as you're paying back that loan, you're going to get your sats back at the end of the day. The beauty of this. Set up Hoddle Hoddle's leveraging Bitcoin's native properties. So that two or three multi sig, you hold a key. Your counterparty has a key. Hoddle Hoddle has the third key. You can't uh, move funds out of the wallet, but you do have visibility into the wallet, which is a good thing because you know that your your sats aren't be being rehypothecated throughout the duration of the loan. You know that you're going to get them back at the end of the day because you know that they're there. So. If you're interested in this, go check it out at lend.hoddlehoddle.com. That's lend.hoddlehoddle.com. Uh, and if you're a stablecoin holder and you want to get some yield on that, you can put it up on the other side of that marketplace. Uh, you put your big, excuse me, you put your stable coins up to be lent out to Bitcoiners looking for a loan, and they pay you back what you gave them plus interest. So again, go check it out lend.hoddlehoddle.com. Make your own offers today no kyc no aml u.s citizens can access this product go check it out sorry i'm a little lethargic today freaks um first night ever my son just didn't go to bed it's a long night it's a long night i'm feeling it you gotta push through you gotta push through you gotta wake up and work this rip was also brought to you by our good friends at compass mining compass mining is here to get more individuals into the mining game the way they do it is they allow you to purchase ASICs and then have them plugged in at hosting facilities with competitive electricity cost. The way it works, you go to compassmining.io, you pick a mining model, what they have available, uh, you buy a miner that is dedicated to you, that is your miner. If you want it sent to your home, you can have that happen. Uh, you're going to be able to follow this throughout its life cycle as it gets plugged into a hosting facility if you end up sending it to a Compass partner hosting facility. They try to make it easy. Again, you buy, you own, you can plug it in, and you get sat streamed straight to a wallet of your choice, wallets of your choice, addresses of your choice. Compass makes it very easy. It's a beautiful thing, getting more individuals into the mining game, helping to further distribute the ownership of hash rates. Interesting concept. The individuals own the ASICs. They plug them into hosting facilities, which... It's a bit of a centralizing factor, but the ability to call those ASICs in kind doesn't mean Compass making this very easy. I think you can make the argument that it's helping 
Make Bitcoin hash rate more distributed. Bitcoin hash rate ownership more distributed to be more specific. So go check these guys out if you're interested in mining. Compassmining.io, C-O-M-P-A-S-S-M-I-N-I-N-G.io. Trying to get more individuals in the mining, baby. It's a beautiful thing. They're blowing up too. Jack Dorsey was tweeting about them. Disclaimer. Jack's the CEO of Square, which is also a sponsor of this spot. Last but not least, this rip is brought to you by good friends at Brains. Brains. Brains OS Plus is what we're here. Is what we're here. Is what we're here to shield today. Brains OS Plus is firmware that you can download onto your ASICs that it's going to allow you to stack more SATs with your hash. It extends your hash. You get more SATs for your hash. We're working on this here. As you know, Brains is the team behind Slush Pool. Slush Pool is the oldest mining pool in the Bitcoin world. Uh, Slush Pool had a recent update, which includes ultra flexible payouts that can be either time based or threshold based. Mining reward splitting for automatically distributing rewards to multiple wallets, and of course, dark theme. So if you're a slush pool user, you haven't taken advantage of that update. I don't think you even have an option. I think it just runs live in the browser. It's live now. Take advantage of these these things. I know Great American Mining, uh, we've been very happy with the way that you can do payouts in a more granular fashion. Makes our lives a lot easier. Back to Brains of Us Plus. Uh, there was an update on that as well recently, and it has full support for Antminer S17E and T17E, as well as some significant improvements to the auto-tuning for all X17 devices. It's available now at Brains. That's two eyes, B-R-A-I-I-N-S dot com slash O-S slash plus. Special announcement, or important announcement. It's not really special, but it's important. Brains OS Plus is compatible with any mining pool. All right, There's a lot of misconceptions out there that if you run the firmware that you need to point your hash at slush pool this is not true you don't need to mine a slush pool to use the firmware but if you do decide to mine a slush pool while using the firmware you're gonna get zero percent pool fees it's a nice little incentive since the network hash rate is still below all-time highs it's great it's a great time for you to juice up your your asics with auto tuning firmware and stack even more sets for those that don't know how this works it comes down to the silicon on the hashing chips there are small variations in the silicon quality for every chip in an ASIC, all right? So typically, stock firmwares, when you get it out of the box, you get it from the manufacturer, they treat the entire device as a uniform unit. I guess it just makes it more efficient for them. I don't know what it is. Maybe they're not going to speculate on anything. Sending the same frequency of voltages through the hash books, okay? So Brains OS Plus boosts performance by experimenting with different frequencies and voltages on each individual chip to learn which chips are higher quality than others. Then it calibrates to see, send, excuse me, send more work to higher quality chips and less work to lower quality ones. The end result of this per chip tuning is more hash and thus more sats per watt of power consumed. Currently supported devices are the Antminer S9, S9i, S9j, as well as the S17, S17 Plus, S17 Pro, T17, T17 Plus, and the ones that were just added, the S17e and the T17e, which we mentioned earlier. They're working on what's minor firmware too. Uh, and as well as the S19s from Bitmain. So be on the lookout for Brains OS Plus firmware for these newer models uh, moving forward. Stay tuned, TM, for more updates on the firmware and slush pool and check out insights.brains.com, I-N-S-I-G-H-T-S dot B-R-A-I-I-N-S dot com. Go there, you're going to check out content, stats, charts, and mining profitability tools to stay on top of everything happening in the mining industry. Freaks, thank you for bearing with this read with Uncle Marty, who slept, I think, less than an hour last night. I'm running on fumes, freaks, but this episode is going to jack you up. Really great rep. Enjoy. Tiki! You've had a dynamic where money's become freer than free. If you talk about a Fed just gone nuts, all, all the central banks going nuts. So it's all acting like safe haven. I believe that in a world where central bankers are tripping over themselves to devalue their currency, Bitcoin wins. In the world of fiat currencies, Bitcoin is the victor. I mean, that's part of the bull case for Bitcoin. If you're not paying attention, you probably should be. What is up, freaks? Welcome back to Tales from the Crypt. It's your boy Marty Bent here for an interview I'm very excited for. I was just explaining 
to our guest then i i found his twitter account a few months ago and just been a huge fan of all the content he's putting out i'm sitting down with blake masters C- coo of Thiel capital president of the Thiel foundation and a gentleman who's running for uh a, a senate seat uh for the state of arizona blake how are you doing today I'm great, Marty. Thanks uh, so much for having me. Thank you for coming on. Again, I'm very excited for this conversation because I think we're, at least what I can tell from uh, your your Twitter account and all the content I've uh, done research on that you've put out, and I think we're very aligned philosophically, and I, I think the message that you're putting out there needs to be spread far and wide, which is a message of American strength and getting back to uh, being proud of being American and, and relying on the ideals that this country was founded on and, and, and alongside that pointing out the hypocrisy and the frankly evil policies of, of the ruling class uh, today and, and, and the fact that they may be leading us astray in, in wayward direction. So maybe that's where we'll start. You're CEO, Thiel Capital, president of the Thiel Foundation. Why would you ever want to go into the public sector? That seems like a, that seems like a, a step down. I know you you uh you probably have to have something wrong with you to want to run for office today, right? But uh hopefully in just the right way. Um I think most politicians are frankly just like sociopaths or they're just in for the power or something like that. Um actually there's a whole lot that's miserable about running for office and being in public office. I don't even like Washington DC, frankly. Uh I like the neoclassical architecture, but not all the ugly modern glass stuff. So I'm doing it because I think it's important. Um, I really do think we're losing the country, and I don't think that's too dramatic. Uh, you know, I have three little little boys, seven, five, and one years old, and um, I think they're on track to grow up in a country that works much less well than the one I grew up in, just a, you know not that long ago, right in the late '80s, early '90s. And um, I think if we don't get a new class of leadership, and young, smart, competent people who actually see the decline and understand understand that it's happening, understand what's driving it, and uh, you know, advocate for bold cultural and political change to fix it. I think we won't have a country uh, in any meaningful sense in, in just you know ten or twenty years. So I think that's bad. I think the United States is the best uh, the best country that's ever existed, and it's this grand experiment. Can can human beings live in freedom and you know, self-government. And I think we're losing that. It's horrible. And I want to put an end to the decline. I do as well. And thank you for uh, fighting this cause because it is a very important one. And, and you mentioned something there, like there's, we've been sort of laid astray that the ruling class is, is really not uh, managing the state of the country very well at all. Uh, so what would you pinpoint as some of the, the, the areas that need to be fixed uh, the quickest or have the most impact uh, and are leading us down this path the most? Like, well, obviously, we've shipped a lot of jobs over to China. Uh, the, the immigration, uh, legal immigration crisis, excuse me, is, um, is still getting out of hand. Uh, and we have a technocracy that, that doesn't like to respect freedom of speech in the digital age. Uh, that's one of the favorite lines from your, your campaign video that you have pinned on your Twitter um, is, is the internet was sold as something that was going to liberate speech and communication. And it's turned into this siloed walled garden um, access to the web where, where these large corporations are able to decide you know, who gets to say what, when, and how. Right. Look, I think all those threats that you just mentioned are huge and not only huge, but existential, right? Like you don't get to have a country if you spend uh, $5 trillion and decades sort of making war in the Middle East and, you know, sending your troops there to die for wars that turn out not to make sense, right? Like $5 trillion in the last few decades. Imagine what that money could have done here domestically. You also don't get to have a country if you don't have a border. And the crisis at the southern border uh, really can't be overstated. I live in Tucson, Arizona, which is just about 100 miles north of our border with Mexico. 
and I've seen it. I've seen it change. There's tent cities here in Tucson. You know, hotel room hotels full of uh, illegal immigrants. The Biden administration has just invited people to come here illegally, which of course just empowers the cartels uh, who, who functionally run the border right now. So we're at a run rate of more than two million illegal immigrants every year coming into this country. Um, unsustainable. You also don't get to have a country that, you know, just prints money uh, willy nilly in seemingly random and unlimited amounts. Um, you know, our national debt's going to top 30 trillion here and no sign of that slowing down, right? Uh, a trillion here, a trillion there, three tr- trillion for this budget bill. Uh, pretty soon, you know, you're, you're talking a, a real impact. And, I, and I, I do worry about it, especially now that people have sort of stopped watching it right now. You have MMT and sort of fancy pseudo academic ways of saying we can just print forever. And I think, of course, anyone who listens to this podcast knows um, or deeply suspects that's not true. So. Look, and then you mentioned big tech, right? And we can talk a lot more about this. That's an existential threat. Like there is no more freedom of speech in this country if you cannot speak your mind on the internet. This stuff is the new town square. And if we allow just a handful of multinational corporations uh, to control the flow of information in our society, you don't have a free society anymore. Um, it's, it's, It's just that simple. So I almost think we can't just pick one or two policy areas to focus on. Um, it really is going to take a full-scale uh, program, a full-scale agenda, um, a reset in order to to have a successful country in the coming decades. Um, it, it all interlocks. It all weaves together. Uh, and I, you know, so I don't understand this this idea that you can just focus on one or two things to fix and everything else will magically work. I think we're badly broken on multiple different fronts and it's going to take a full, full, full core press. Agreed. Agreed. And it feels like uh, a lot of the country, a lot of citizens of this country, I think we have to take um, some responsibility for this. There's been a a complacency, if you will, people are just happy with going about their jobs, going to the bars on weekends and going about their lives and not really thinking about these types of things until they're forced to, which I think the last 18 months specifically with what, what's gone on with the, the economic lockdowns and, and the money printing and the increased censorship around the spread of quote unquote misinformation about things going on in the world right now is starting to wake people up like, hey, what the hell's going on here? Why are we not allowed to go to work? Why, why can't we say these things and discuss? Right certain topics on social media and it's um that complacency it has put us in a bad spot and so like moving uh, towards a, a world that respects freedom more is, is it's going to be a fight right because we we got so complacent that we've created such large problems and obviously like you mentioned we focus mainly on the problem of money printing on this podcast because i believe wholeheartedly that it, uh, if you fix the money, you fix the world. I think the, the mispricing and misallocation of capital that has run rampant throughout our economy uh, that has allowed us to go waste trillions of dollars in the Middle East and created subsidies and markets here at home that, that probably otherwise shouldn't get those subsidies. Uh, one that we focus on here is the, the quote unquote renewable energy market as well. Um, there's a lot of clawing back and fixing. So I, I, I like that you said that it's not one policy that you focus on. This is, this is a terribly broken country and that has a lot of problems that need to be uh, identified and, and actively attempted to, to, to reverse. And, and like you said, in the beginning of this conversation, there's, I'm a millennial, I'm 30 years old. And a lot of people in my age don't think their, their life's going to get better over time. I think it's only going to get worse. And that's just a terrible mental state to have a whole cohort of and, and demographic in uh, across the country it's it's pretty depressing right and i think i think this is the first time that's ever happened in american history hard to know exactly how they were polling this you know 200 years ago or whatever but this really is the first generation i'd say millennials and generation z below them who don't expect to be better off than their parents in fact they expect to be worse off than their parents and uh you know, what an indictment of our society that that 
that could become true. Um, I think that's on track to become true. It's, it's sort of literally the opposite of the American dream, right? We've been seeing this in basically every social or economic indicator uh, that you can measure. It's downward mobility. It's stagnant wages, you know, wages upticked. Uh, during the Trump administration for the first time in decades, but basically stagnant wages in the in the face of rising costs for everything that actually matters: healthcare, education, housing. Um, you know, your your big screen TV gets better and cheaper every year. Your iPhone gets faster every year. You know, you have Netflix, and uh, you can order whatever you want on Postmates and. Marijuana, you know, bespoke marijuana strains delivered to your door or whatever. But this is all, it's all a cope. It's all a cope. And, and you mentioned earlier complacency. And I do think complacency is a huge problem. Um, and maybe it's one that's in some ways, you know, uh, just a natural product of prosperity. I remember Daniel Bell's book, The Cultural Contradictions of Capitalism, which just talks about how capitalism is fantastic at generating wealth. Right, which is great. That's why we love it. Um, doesn't have a whole lot to say uh, itself about the values, you know, that that a society should have, or like how you should spend that wealth, or importantly how you shouldn't. And so, if you get too wealthy, um, in some sense, you get decadent. Right, Ross Duthert wrote this book about uh, how our societies become too decadent. And I think in normal times, pre-COVID, you know, maybe the danger was people really got used to it and millennials learned to have low expectations, right? Like don't even bother wanting that house. You know, your parents may have bought a house when they were newly married, 24 year olds, but it's not in the cards for you because of globalization. So don't worry about it. And, you know, people just turn to amusements and sort of turn inward. It's about your finding your authentic self instead of no (laughs) replicating yourself through having a family and children and, you know, projecting existence out into the future. So I think all this stuff is bad, but let me agree with you that maybe the one silver lining of the COVID pandemic and all the crazy sort of lockdown response to it has been to wake people up. You know, there's this um, micro version or I say acute version in school and education contexts where parents finally understood all the garbage and toxic crap that their kids were being taught because their kids are being taught for the last 18 months over Zoom, right, in their living rooms, so they could actually see this curriculum. Um, and I think that's kind of inspired this backlash against the critical race theory and the 1619 history curriculum and all this stuff. But I think more broadly than any acute backlash, people just realize now how often they're being lied to, how often the media elite and the ruling class or the establishment or whatever you want to call it, how often that narrative is just a sales pitch to keep people complacent. But people know there's something that's not right, right? Everybody intuits that uh, that things are really off. We were lied to about Afghanistan. You know, we're being lied to six different ways from Sunday on vaccines, sort of COVID health data, what's actually happening or the importance of lockdowns. And so I don't think anyone's come and, and, and really... Um, articulated this or sort of been the, the voice of the people on this, on this issue and like where to go from here. But I do think 60 or 70% of the people in this country know it's on a very bad track and they just really intuit uh, for the first time. They see behind the curtain a little bit. They intuit that things are really messed up. And I think our backs are against the wall. And the question is, will we figure it out and you know, navigate through these challenging times and find a way forward? Or is this is this grand experiment going to come to an end? Yeah, I, when you were just going through, I couldn't think of the stop thinking of the phrase "you'll own nothing and you'll be happy." So the, the, the in staying on the ruling class, like that's the other odd thing about today's day and age. It seems like they're actively just trying to put a spell on the world, like, "Hey, globalization's happening. You're going to love it. Don't worry. Don't worry. Keep keep watching Netflix." keep ordering pot to your home. You're not going to own a house. You're going to live in a pod. Everything you're ever going to need is going to be 15 minutes away from, from your pod. And and you're, you're going to have your biometrics hooked up to uh, your, your central bank digital currency wallet. And we're going to have complete control over you. And they're just actively selling this dystopian 
vision of the future with with a smile on their face and and some people are falling for it hook line and sinker but others are like all right this is really cr- it's crazy and scary uh we need to stop this but i guess the question is how do we need more strong leaders like yourself stepping up are we going to fix this via the traditional means via the political system specifically here in the united states or do we need something like a bitcoin like a parallel system that we that we build out as as this decaying system dies and we just transition and opt out of of the decaying system to these parallel systems what is the best way forward are we able to actually fix well, i guess <laughs> yeah i mean let a let a thousand uh, flowers bloom here. I think it'd be a mistake to um, put all our eggs in one basket, so to speak. Obviously, I am optimistic um, that that we can work things out in the political realm. You know, it's why I'm running for office. I think it's a open question. You know, I don't think it's automatically going to happen. Um, you know, I mean, I, it, look, I have a, a tough primary race and then a tough general election race. And then say I get in office, I'm now a United States senator. Even then it's going to be hard, right? Like I, I know um, <clears throat> this stuff <laughs> isn't exactly easy. I just think uh, it really does matter. And our, our rulers, or leaders, whatever you want to call them, elected officials, I think for the most part, don't have courage and don't have vision. And I think one thing to learn from President Trump, you know, say what you will, people have different uh, um, judgments on how effective his administration was. I think they did a lot of great things. He came along and he was willing to, to do things differently, right? He was willing to say things that um, sort of weren't allowed to say or weren't supposed to say, but 60 or 70 percent of people knew that they were true. And he showed that with courage, and conviction, you really can bust up the establishment and do something new in politics. Of course, then the establishment wants to uh, attack you like like nothing you've ever seen before. And Trump was able to withstand that. But I do think um, he showed me that new things are possible in politics. I still think government's really important. Obviously, I think it's too powerful in most ways, but also incompetent. And so I'm interested in and what can we do to have a smaller but more laser focused, more competent government like the one we used to have? Um, that said, you know, I'm, I'm open about uh, the challenges and we may not be able to, to fix everything through politics. It may take structural change. Like the Internet was a technological development that really changed the way the world worked. And um, that wasn't centrally planned, even if its origins were in you know, defense research or whatever. And, uh, you know, Bitcoin is even more decentralized. And so, you know, to the extent people are, you know, everyone's got to focus on on one thing to work on. I'm focused on politics. Uh, Bitcoin devs are focused on Bitcoin and crypto people are building out some alternative ecosystem. I think that stuff's important, too. Um, it, it may be that it's technologies like that that ultimately are responsible for preserving, you know, freedom on this planet. Uh, if, if folks like myself, you know, J.D. Vance, um, the Josh Hollies of the world, if, if we can't get it done in the political arena, I'm certainly grateful for, for innovators. And, and technology is important, right? Like I have a technology background. I run Teal Capital, uh, a technology investment firm. For the longest time, I really did think that our only hope was to have technological development outpace, you know, sort of political decay. And, you know, if you get that ratio right, okay, maybe your government sucks, but, you know, people can, can live longer, healthier, more prosperous and more free lives if, if we're developing technology. The problem is government so often retards and impedes technological development. Like, look at all the wrenches that they're trying to throw uh, in, in the recent Senate bills into the crypto ecosystem, right? Like, these people don't know what they're doing, but they're happy to stifle development or look at nuclear reactor technology, right? We, we know how to build clean, modern nuclear reactors, and there's sort of no regulatory pathway to actually allow a startup to do it. And so we have this, you know, these self-imposed energy crises. And so I think the political stuff matters a whole lot. One of my goals in politics is to sort of make uh, an environment, an ecosystem that's safe for innovation. 
Um, and in general, I think politicians are all too good at, at quashing it in advance. And I, I think the infrastructure bill specifically reminded me actually what radicalized me in the first place, which was the TARP bill and drove me to college. I was a senior in high school when TARP was passed and went to college with a know your enemy mentality. Like how the hell did it get this bad? Um, but the, the, the thing that radically radicalized me about TARP and similarly with this infrastructure bill was just like how much crap was it like in a dire time or something that is marketed as a dire time in American history and we need everybody to come together. It was just a bunch of people uh, trying to get favors included in these bills. And it's, it's very infuriating understanding that that's the process, but we, I don't want to dive too much into that. I just wanted to make that comment. I do want to dive into like, if you had control over uh, you get into the Senate and you're, you're actively able to push forward uh, good ideas and policies. Like, w what are the first things that you do when in office? What are you trying to, to fix specifically first? And, and w what are your policy recommendations? Whether there be geo or excuse me, um, like the way we interact with other countries internationally, what we do uh, economically here at home and, and how we, and uh, how we, uh, basically facilitate the the ongoing innovation on the in the tech sector here in the United States as well. Yeah, I think a day one thing to do is to uh, authorize the completion of the border wall. You know, I've been down there to see it. I think the wall is really impressive. Walls, of course, uh, are an ancient piece of technology. They really do work. Um, and the border was under control December 2020, the tail end of the Trump administration. Now it's sort of a disaster. So um you know it's not that innovative it's just like finish the wall and double or triple the size of the border patrol force pay those guys better you know get them the technology they need so you know in some ways not that exotic right um but there's all these fires like that that we have to put out and then you know then we can do the the really interesting stuff like what um how can we change education in this country you know, it's a cliche that it all goes back to education. It all goes back to the schools. It's also true. And um, I think, you know, so much of education in this country or so much of education has just become about schooling, right? And we have this whole model that's basically invented in the late 19th century to train Prussian military officers you know, to conform to standards and to be super regimented and be an effective force. And that's just, I'm not sure it ever worked that well. It used to work better than it does. Right now, it's just failing uh, millions and millions and millions of students. Like, we are not, we're not even serious about that model of education, and yet we still sort of do it on autopilot. And so, thinking about new and different ways um, to do K through 12, that maybe, you, should, you know, most people won't go to college in this country. And uh, most people probably shouldn't go to college in this country. The problem is we've built a whole society that sort of expects people to that teaches you that that's the only way you can have a successful future or that all the jobs that you know will pay well in the future require a four-year degree so you're sort of looked down on if you don't do it actually that's insane we could be uh, teaching people how to actually interact in the world how to actually find something they're interested in and that suits them and develop skills and we should just be demanding a lot more from our young people and empowering them to actually get out and do stuff. And instead, we sit them in a class, you know, for 10 hours a day, lecture them mostly about left-wing left politics. If they graduate, mostly they can't even read or write in any meaningful way relative to what their grandparents would have been able to do at the same level of schooling. So very interested in um, fixing education. I think most of that should be done at the sort of state and local level. But... Um, you know, there's a lot that the federal government's involved in now, and some of that should be pared back. There's a lot that it's going to continue to stay involved in, and we should figure out how to how to do better. So it's a broad answer, but this yeah. idea that you have to go to college to succeed, I think, is insane, and I think it just, I think it does such a disservice to young people. It almost makes me sick. Yeah, especially considering the amount of debt they go into get the degrees and come out realizing that the, the return on that debt capital is not going to be uh, high enough. And to... that debt is non-dischargeable. You can't <laughs> get rid of it, even if you go bankrupt. And Joe Biden wrote that law. Yeah. Right? It makes no sense. You'd never let a 19-year-old 
take out a hundred and fifty thousand dollar loan, you know, to buy a to buy a house with no down payment, even if you know he could show a sort of stable job. Um, no bank would make that that lending decision, but we let that same aged kid take out even more money in some cases, again with no down payment, non dischargeable debt, so that he can go get a degree in English literature. You know, probably through those three years at school, actually become like less empowered, less effective as an individual. Yeah, it's insanity. It's truly crazy. And going even further, or excuse me, earlier uh, in in an individual's education in the public schooling system here, like it, it, it almost seems like they're actively trying to make people dumber. Like the uh, what is they changed the math? What is the the new math standard that everybody's running with now? Common Core, where you literally created a system where parents can't help their kids with their homework because they're doing math in a completely right. different way. And their parents learn, and it, it almost seems like a concerted effort to dumb down uh, the the individuals going through the public schooling system here in the United States. It really does. I never know if that's the intent or that's just the outcome. And you know, I've decided it doesn't really matter. No, it doesn't really matter. Like I care about results, not intentions, and it's just. So pathetic, but you got to remember the goal was never to do what's best for each individual child, which of course, if you focused on, that's how you actually get a healthier, you know, family, a healthier town, a healthier state, a healthier country. Uh, the goal was to sort of reduce everybody to some common denominator. And then we've seen that that common denominator is just itself falling every year as we lower the standards. Yeah, and talking about thinking how to best empower individual students, like who better to know how to do that than parents, right? And so how do you give parents more autonomy and more power and you know, decision making in this? And that's why I think like school choice is a very interesting policy and, and one that I, I like a lot. I've had Corey DeAngelis um, from Cato and the Reason Foundation on who's, who's a really big school choice advocate. And I think that's just like a no brainer. Like, if you're going to subsidize schooling uh, and the public schooling system is failing why not give money directly to parents who can then make a decision on on where is best to get their their children uh, their children's education absolutely including including by the way uh homeschool you know uh i think that states should be passing laws that say yeah the money follows the student that's good but the money doesn't just follow the student to a charter school or to a private school that money, or maybe that money subtracted, you know, uh, of overhead costs. You don't have in a homeschool. That should follow the student right back home. Like pay, pay, teach pay parents to teach their kids, or maybe just return some of their tax money. You know, that's probably the the right framing. Um, but I'm a big fan of of homeschooling. I know it's you know doubled in popularity since since COVID. My wife and I homeschool our three boys and. Um, you know, it just gives you gives you control, and obviously you got to take the kids out and you know expose them to different environments. But this idea that kids should all be gathered together in uh, lockstep with people their exact same age and sort of sat down and lectured at for hours on end, it really doesn't make any sense. They could be out interacting with people uh, who are making things or you know going on going on trips traveling, um, just independent reading. There's so much that you do. I mean, if you think about kids too, they're always being educated. They're always learning, right? We just conflate in our society education with schooling. And I think very little of what people actually learn that is actually helpful to them comes from a classroom. So the right way to think about it is your whole childhood is an education. And then how do you get kids to interact um, you know, with each other, but also with adults, and with their environment in meaningful ways, because they're always learning from that. And so in some sense, I think school, the modern formulation of it just lobotomizes them in advance, you know, like, allegedly for some greater good. Yeah, I know. Intent isn't as important as results, but again, it's like almost like the intent is evil. Like you have children who have so much energy and curiosity and you just stick them in a room, a stuffy room. With, uh, Frankly, probably somebody who's medicate them if they, you know, especially the young, the young men out there, 
um, who are watching the clock because they know it just defends their very sense of being as an eight year old boy to be sitting down all day to like, you know, learn about how dumb their country is. Um, so they medicate them. Right. Yeah. That's well, Johnny's having trouble paying attention to my <laughs> horrible, uh, pedagogy. So here's some amphetamines, you know, take, take these pills and be okay. It, it, it really is dark. It really is dark. And again, we don't have to go down the intention versus you know, just bad effects route, but we can just do so much better. I, I like, I know we can, but it only starts if you get people who are um, sort of in positions of influence, like political leaders, cultural leaders, if people sort of say it out loud, the emperor has no clothes here. Like the system is failing. And if you raise one or two or three generations of kids, on this model, which is thrown standards out the window. Again, it's not even good at doing what it's, uh, it's not even good on its own terms. And maybe those terms themselves are like really wrong, but you raise one or two or three generations of, of Americans like that. And pretty soon those people are running the companies and in charge of government. And that's the electorate. And, you know, it's this, it's, it's this um, decline in human capital that, yeah, we've almost just wished upon ourselves yeah. and that won't work. It no. won't work unless we get people to, uh, to call that out and do something about it. Yeah, you end up at a spot where you can't engineer airplanes, new cars, innovative ways to extract that's energy. Right. And it, and remember that's, that's like the, um, it, it, it's almost cliche, but that's the, the bit from, uh, Atlas Shrugged, right? It's just like, and you, all, all sorts of criticism to that book, although, there's something genius in it, but this idea that like, it's hard to build the light bulb. It's hard to electrify a whole country. Um, it's much easier to keep that stuff running once it's already built. But after a certain sort of generation over generation decline, pretty soon you could imagine a future in the United States where like we as the body politic don't even know how to run the systems that our ancestors built, you know, and like, that sounds crazy. It certainly seems sort of, you know, crazy when Ayn Rand wrote it. And then you look at the California power grid, huh. like for all sorts of reasons, they're unable to keep the lights on in nominally, you know, over more wealthier states. Really crazy. The, the energy theme the transition to unreliable quote unquote renewables is one of the scariest trends that's happening in markets and in, in this country, particularly and one of the most idiotic. Like if you just take a step back and try to look at energy, how important it is and the, the, the sources which they're trying to transition us to, it's like, all right, can you not understand the, the concept of unreliability? The fact that wind doesn't blow all, <laughs> all the time the sun doesn't shine all the time uh and you're and you're phasing out very clean nuclear power for these unreliables and then you're wondering why you're having rolling blackouts and brownouts years after the decommissioning of those reliable energy sources it, it's it seems pretty straightforward and pretty simple of a concept to understand but we have a this government wants to pass the the green new deal which is going to mandate that we that we transition to these unreliables it's extremely scary and, and frankly like insane that we would even go down this path having examples like germany trying to do this over the last two decades and the only the result of that is energy prices are like two to three x more expensive and uh their carbon output is like 10x as high because they're having to import uh, a bunch of quote unquote dirty energy sources from from other countries but the germans feel so good about the work they're doing for the environment you know, and it just because it's it's emotional. It has nothing to do with actual real world consequences. They had nuclear, right? They had so much nuclear and they just decided, I think for mostly ideological reasons, you know, they'll have other explanations. But I, I think it's mostly ideological, mostly emotional to just go the other way. It's like literally going back to the past. And as well, you said, they're they're sure paying for it. And it's it's a very anti-human policy. And again, if you look at the results, and look at the in the intention, maybe very rosy. Hey, we we need to save the planet. 
to save humans, uh, to save the poor, uh, the poor are the most affected by climate change, the climate emergency. And then you look at the, the consequences of this transition on reliables and actually affects the poor the most because it increases electricity prices for them, makes electricity variable uh, uh, to an extent, and that affects the poor the most. <laughs> the cheap energy is the emergence of cheap energy and abundant cheap energy correlates very tightly with human flourishing over the last 150 years to think that we can just phase out energy sources to quote unquote save the planet uh, is ridiculous. It's anti-human. There's a, there's a, a huge anti-human movement in, in the green energy space and, and people don't realize it, but totally. they, they think they're helping the planet. They're actually making it considerably worse off. I mean, you have Texas, the energy capital of the U S having rolling blackouts because Rick Perry sent out a path of, of subsidizing wind and solar production uh, in favor of weatherizing their their natural gas lines or or in investing more heavily in nuclear, it's, it's we live in an insane world. That's always my litmus test for people who um, you know want to quote save humanity or save the planet. I, is do they support nuclear power? You know, it's like okay, you're concerned about climate change. That's that's makes sense. You know, I mean, we should figure out like how much the how much the earth is warming um, and you know, are humans causing it? And then what are the, you know, sort of trade-offs? Is that all bad? Is that good in some ways and mostly bad or what's that look like? And then what are the policies we could enact and what are the costs and benefits of those? We could run through that calculus, but I hear you, you're concerned about climate. Um, so clearly you're in favor of nuclear power, right? And, you know, left-wingers heads just explode. It's like, no, 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 it's, it's not safe. And despite the fact that, like, you know, of the, the very notable handful of nuclear power disasters have actually been reasonably contained. And uh, besides, that's like old reactor technology. We know how to do it now in ways that are much cleaner and much safer, small amounts of, you know, nuclear waste. And then they want to say, well, we can't bury the nuclear waste because in 10,000 years, you know, our descendants may um, dig it up. And, and we don't know how to communicate with them, you know, sort of chemical for Leibowitz style <laughs> scenario. And it's like, at that point, that's so fanciful that it, it's, they, they just, for ideological reasons, want to take the one thing that actually works super well off the table. Yeah, and yeah. it's just depressing because I think of people in the 1950s and 1960s, you know, you had the development of the atomic bomb and, and they were used. Um, that was sort of horrible and scary and it's the new atomic age, but the promise of the atomic age was always, you know, to sort of de-weaponize it and, and use that technology to harness all the energy that we have here on earth. And like, you could have expected energy too cheap to meter if you were growing up in the sort of, you know, space age. Um, and instead it's just gone the other way. 60 years later, we're, you know, still paying through the nose for energy. And again, I, I know we're in it, we're in like a mass hysteria because if you look at the data, literally the deaths per megawatt hour produced by nuclear as an energy source compared to all other sources, I think is the lowest, even compared to like wind and solar. Yeah, it's abundant. It'll never run out. I mean, I'm not a peak oil guy. I think we have a lot of oil. Um, you know, there's the whole fracking revolution. Like, I'm, like we should use our natural resources. And I, I look at oil and uh and gas you know the same way i look at um sunlight and wind frankly and uh nuclear it's like we have all this stuff but you just have to be wise you have to let markets work you have to use what you have and uh and we don't do that you know we want to shut down oil pipelines again for ideological reasons biden doesn't care how many people that throws out of work he doesn't care how, how that affects people, you know, paying higher prices at the pump. Um, he just wants to subsidize solar and wind because that's, that's where the partisan politics, you know, say that he's got to spend his time. And it's like, okay, well, at least he could lump nuclear in too, because that's sort of a clean, you know, tech that actually works. And if you're going to subsidize anything, maybe you should be doing that. It's like, no, 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 couldn't possibly do that. Um, that's dangerous. And then they invent all these fake reasons. So 
it's it's energy it's here on earth we have the technical know-how to convert it right now it's like oil and gas work really well solar you know to the extent that it's not like crazy subsidized sure you want to put solar panels on your house great i think that's good as you said there's some reliability problems um but really we ought to get the get politicians to to not just do stupid stuff with oil and gas which they just love messing with because they fantasize about some clean future um that's the defense kind of keep the status quo going but then on offense long term we should just be pro-nuclear like it's just that simple yeah, and they, 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 when it comes to oil and gas they go for I've been trying to think of how to phrase it. The only way I can say is the nuclear option, pun intended, of just like completely phasing it out instead of attempting to become more efficient with those sources. Uh, like obviously, there's a. It's ton- already become so much more efficient. Like fracking is so much cleaner. You know. Yeah. Then, and- then it, it it just doesn't make sense. And I, look, I think oil and gas are going to be with us for a long time, and they should be. We have plentiful deposits. The technology is getting better and better. Um, we have this stuff in the United States, which is huge, right? Environmentalists don't like it because they don't want to ever touch anything. Um, But like we have these resources and we should use them. We should use them wisely, but like we should use them for our own human flourishing. This is something that Trump understood. And in his administration, we got to net energy independence. That is a striking achievement. There's also a national security component to that. Meanwhile, then Biden takes over, right? Cancels our pipeline, starts approving pipelines in Russia. And um, now we're begging OPEC for oil. It's like I, I literally forgot the term OPEC during the whole Trump administration, right? Because it, it had become irrelevant, basically, more or less to a, to a first approximation. And now we're begging OPEC for more oil, you know, to alleviate our self-induced energy uh, price spike really crazy stuff again it's insane and i th- the free market is f- figuring out these problems so much better and again obviously i'm biased i work for a company great american mining we go to oil and gas fields and we go up to the well pad upstream and we say hey don't flare your natural gas you're wasting that and then yeah there is methane leak could be bad for the environment like let's get as much value out of that gas as possible we'll buy it from you we're going to use it to power generators that then electrify our our Bitcoin miners. And like, that's like, and that is just pure economic incentive for what we do. We need to drive our cost of power production down as low as possible. And this gas that nobody wants to use has no pipeline capacity to get to market is the, the cheapest energy that we can find because uh, they're willing to sell to us cheaply because they can't do anything else with it. And that's just our need to drive our costs down, led us to this solution that allows producers to make more money, to be more efficient, with their operations and to pollute less. We didn't need a government to tell us that. We didn't need any subsidies to drive us there. Like the free market can figure this stuff out if it's just allowed to attempt to even do it. And that's such a shame of the state of the country. It's, it's just turning on free markets. And you mentioned MMT, all this money printing. Like I, I would argue we don't even live in a free market because there's so much top-down attempts to dictate how these markets should work. ESG movement is another form of that in the capital markets. And it, it, you're not going to get good results when you're trying to micromanage a whole country of 330 million people uh, via capital flows, whether it be from the government or uh, like a movement like the ESG movement, in my, in my opinion. Yeah, I think that's right. And some sometimes I think we live in sort of the the worst quadrant on the two by two matrix where we take the, the, all the downsides of a market-based approach. And there's only one, which is like, there's, there's the profit motive, right? People want to make money. People are naturally greedy. And I think that's fine and great. That's just, it's, it's where we are um, as a species <laughs> until we have, until we evolve out of it in 6 million years. But um, the, the free market so beautifully harnesses, right? This is just classic Adam Smith. I don't know. We don't need to spend any time on it, but it harnesses people's, uh, self-interest in, in really beautiful and productive ways. Um, and if you have this system that's only quasi-private, where, especially in a consolidating industry, right, you see this in hospital systems, which are basically rackets at this point. You see this with like big social media companies, right? They're only nominally private. They're so intertwined with the government and with the regulatory scheme that you preserve the profit motive 
right? So executives are still just trying to make a lot of money, but you know, the, the losses are socialized, the costs are socialized. So much of the capital allocation that goes on because it's interacting with these regulatory environments is, is just messed up. And so you, you, you know, look at our healthcare system. It's like, we don't even get the efficiency of um, sort of single payer systems in Europe. I'm not saying we should go that way. I don't think we should, but you sort of have nominally private companies that are just trying to extract rents from this collectivized system. Um, and so we wind up paying like twice as much for, you know, no better outcomes than many of the European countries. It's truly the worst of all worlds. Now I think we need to deregulate and get market pricing actually back into the healthcare system. Um, you know, that's the only way you're ever going to control costs, but it's, it's just a shame. And then, you know what, free markets and capitalism, they'll take the blame, right? They take, they're already taking the blame in this country for the, the wealth inequality, which is only just exploding. They're already taking the blame for the middle class, you know, being hollowed out. It's like, well, this is just what happens in a capitalist globalizing economy. And it's like, no, that's not true at all. That's not true at all. Our American decline was a policy choice. It's a policy choice to, uh, you know, have lopsided trade agreements with other countries, whereby we ship our semiconductor industry to Southeast Asia. That's a policy choice and different policy choices could have kept that whole industry here in the United States. And that would have been perfectly consistent with free market principles. So it's frustrating, but you know, I, I, the silver lining is it doesn't work. All the overregulation, all the bureaucracy, you know, the sort of fusion between state power and enormously concentrated corporate power. Ultimately, it just doesn't work. It's failing to produce a society that's, you know, prosperous for the average person. It's failing to produce, um, I think, a healthy culture. And people see that. And so I think we'll correct out of it. And then the question is just, Again, to go back to earlier in our discussion, the question is, can we fix it with politics or is the system too broken? Um, if the system's too broken, can we fix it with technology, you know, blockchain, decentralization, um, or will, will we get some just crazy, you know, innovation in energy that, uh, that kind of makes all this moot? I just, ultimately, I go back to the politics. I think politics is so enmeshed in everything that uh, the best way I know how to fix things is to try to dive in, you know, with a, with a machete and try to clear a bunch of brush away. And then speaking of politics, it, 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 uh, something I mentioned before we had recorded, that I want to discuss with you, like how, how much of how many of these problems could be solved by states asserting their rights uh, and their autonomy from the federal government and just welcoming people to come into their borders and, and act in a way in which they deem would, would fix the problems of the world. And again, another theme of the last 18 months has been this reassertion of state rights and the, the jurisdictional arbitrage that, that has sort of bloomed in the United States as some states have decided not to lock down their citizens and allow them to make decisions for themselves as opposed to others. Uh, which have gone in the complete opposite direction. So Americans now more than ever, I believe have, have, uh, very stark options and can use their feet and uh, send their capital to a place where uh, their values align more closely. Like me personally, I'm moving from New York State to Texas because I, I don't agree with what's going on in New York. And I decided, hey, me and my family are not going to contribute our tax dollars to a state that I think is doing evil things. I'm going to go to Texas where they're allowing us to be free and we can, we can, um, we can live the lives and live to the um, sort of values that, that we have. Totally. I think that, uh, I think that's an important trend. I also think, um, I also think it's possible to overstate it or to, to think that that's going to solve all of our problems. Ultimately, there's no running from the federal government. It, uh, you know, we can either go in and, and sort of fix it and pair it back and make it better at, at its core functions, or it's just going to continue to grow and grow and get out of control. And, you know, ultimately it's, you know, it's like the death of a star and then it'll just, it'll just get white hot and 
grow so big and it'll collapse on itself. And there's a lot that individual governors can do and individual states can do. And so I think, yeah, Texas has been this fantastic haven for people fleeing California. So it's Florida. Those are usually the two places they go. Certainly in Arizona, we're trying to attract, you know, people who who flee from these democratic places that don't work. They're welcome here as long as they remember why they fled where they did. Um, but, but, you know, there's only so much you can do. I think, I think there's a lot more that states could do. And yet, ultimately, like, as a governor, you're probably going to lack the power to defy a Leviathan federal, federal government that's gotten too big. Um, so I welcome all states who want to assert more state sovereignty. I do think that's like a very real thing that we've lost, right? As it's become sort of one consolidated nation under one federal government that's probably too big, too strong, certainly too ham-handed. Um, I just don't want to be be naive. Or a lot of people here in Arizona say like, okay, the federal government is completely blowing it at the southern border. So let's just, you know, why can't Governor Ducey you know, build a build a new wall 15 feet back, you know, on on Arizona land. Um, and it's a great idea in, in theory anyway. And I suspect that if he tried to do it, which I don't think he will, you know, he'd immediately get tied up in litigation and federal courts would find that it's a federal immigration is a federal prerogative and he doesn't have the power to do it. And, you know, then you're at this awkward decision point like do you obey and fall in line or do you resist and with what means do you resist so i think the power dynamic is all out of whack but i actually don't think just saying like oh 10th amendment is enough and you've got to get people in washington who actually understand this otherwise we're never going to get the healthy dynamic between the states and the federal government back again Mm -hmm. i've got an idea i'm trying to meme this into existence bitcoin permanent funds you have states that have energy, a lot of energy resources that are untapped or being wasted. Tap into those energy resources, mine Bitcoin with them, and roll the proceeds of those mining operation, operations into a permanent fund that over time gets to such a size that they can fund the operations within their state by themselves. And they can turn around to the federal government and say, hey, thank you for offering up these funds, but we don't need them. Is this a good idea? Does this make any sense? It could be a great idea. I love it. Like maybe, maybe it's hard to, do. you know, the one thing that I, uh, even, even I have this nagging feeling about it is I'm like, that sounds great. And could you actually imagine a state doing it? Like actually pulling it off at the sort of level of technical competency or tell me if I'm wrong and if some state's doing this, but I, I feel like the decline in state capacity is such that you almost can't even seriously propose stuff like this because everybody sort of knows there would be some review process and you'd get consultants involved and then you'd have to bid it out to, you know, all these different service providers and somehow it would just get eaten by the, by the machine of process. But if that's wrong and we could actually do it, I think that's the kind of bold thinking that we need uh, if we're going to have a good future. Is any state doing anything like that or has any state converted part of its, uh, part of its, balance sheet to bitcoin not yet but the conversations are happening um focusing on smaller states small energy rich states yep. uh is so uh, great american mining i've been advising members of some states about about this idea and, and there are some states that are receptive to it especially states that have been heavily affected by the the ban on uh, new mineral leases on federal lands um they seem pretty pre- uh, pissed off that, that that got passed and pushed through and forced on them on a whim uh, and and seemed to be open to yep to doing things that are crazy. i would love to see that happen just the more self-sufficiency and it's hard to do maybe without bitcoin and without stuff like this because you know just the way the tax receipts work most taxes you know don't go to your town they don't go to your state they go to the federal government you know if you're out here in arizona you send all this money to dc And then they send it back with tons of conditions on it. And obviously those conditions are mostly net negative, mostly ham-handed, mostly just not good. Um, I would love to see 
more revenue actually going into the states. Of course, the states aren't going to be able to raise taxes and and lower federal income taxes, right? It's hard. That's a hard, it's a one way ratchet there. Um, but if you can develop alternative ways of being like very prosperous, then I think that's one way states can can actually assert more sovereignty. That seems great to me. Yeah. I'm going to keep pushing that idea. I think uh, it seems like a great idea to me too. You know, it'd just be really cool to see uh, sort of a state adopting that, that model um, and using this digital cash system in the form of Bitcoin to help you know, maintain sovereignty or excuse, not even maintain, but achieve sovereignty at some point in the future. Um, it would be really cool. And I think it makes sense. And it's something that I'm going to keep pushing. Um, Blake, I've, taking an hour of your time. You're an extremely um, busy individual. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to wrap up and just get some final thoughts from you. Like, well, are you optimistic about the future? Obviously things seem pretty dire. There's a, there's a lot of uh, things in this country, particularly that are, that are off kilter and we may be going down a bad path now, but do you, are you confident that we could turn the ship around, right the ship and, and get on a path in which our children could be optimistic about their futures? I am confident about that, but it's conditional. We have to do the work. Um, you know, I'm, I'm running for office. I think, I think we can turn the ship around. I think it's also a <laughs> ship that badly needs maintenance. I think uh, the rudder is not exactly super responsive. You know, we could develop this metaphor a whole lot more, but I don't think, I don't think the ship has sailed, so to speak. If, if it, if it had, you know, I wouldn't, wouldn't be running. I wouldn't be trying to, to do this. Um, that said, I don't think it's going to happen by accident and it's not going to be easy. And I think the odds, you know, in any sort of statistical sense, I'm not sure it's helpful to think of it that way, but uh, they'd have to be against us. And so the, the question is, what do we do? If you believe the future is going to take care of itself automatically, sort of paralyzing, you won't do anything, you won't have to. If you think the future is going to be definitely worse, um, you will spend no effort trying to make it better. You'll just hunker down and try to take care of yourself and, and your family. Um, I'm in the middle, which is where I think history is. And I think that's, that's where everything interesting is. It, it really could break our way if we do the right stuff. And yet our back is up against the wall. I think every institution in our society has basically become corrupted with some kind of left-wing politics or just complacency and inertia and bureaucracy to be less ideological about it. And they're all rotting. They're rotting from within. And our state capacity is declining as the state itself sort of grows in power. We get to, to this place that looks a lot like anarcho-tyranny. Um, you know, rules are selectively enforced, but it's basically lawless. And all of it seems bad. So I think uh, with a smile on my face, I want to dive into the fray and see what I can do to reverse it. But I think if we get a whole... A whole I guess by, by definition, an electoral majority, but also just a cultural majority here uh, of the 60 or 70 percent of people in this country who I think are super commonsensical. You know, most Americans are like really good people um, and they know that something is badly broken and it's going to be hard to find our way out. But I'm just unprepared to say it's it's all lost. So the future is ours if we fight for it, but only if. Yeah, that's the way I like to frame it as well as like the opportunity this stuff's so broken the opportunity to make it better is so large like it should be an exciting prospect for anybody who's uh, driven to do good in the world there's a lot to fix and it's going to take a lot of effort but I, I do think i'm optimistic as well and i do agree that people need to to get off their ass and actually make it happen um, and that's why things like bitcoin make me extremely optimistic about the future because that is an example of people getting off their ass and saying all right we're going to build this because it's better and we need it and so this has been a great conversation Blake. i'm very excited that you're running for office again i think we need more young smart competent people like yourself in uh, the federal government even if i loathe the federal government but um it is exciting to see some sensical people at least attempting to get in there so i i wish you uh, the best of luck during your campaign and, and hoping that you are successful and get, and get voted into the Senate. Um, and again, just thank you for speaking common sense in the face of pure 
mass hysteria and insanity in this world. It's like people like you, individuals like you that give me hope that we can right the ship as well. Um, and I think the, the message that, that you're sending out is, is getting picked up by people. Again, the last 18 months, people are, are really beginning to, to understand that things are terribly broken and they need a brighter vision to be put in front of them. And I think you're providing that. So thank you. Well, thank you, Marty. It's a pleasure to chat with you today. And uh, if I can close with just um, two ways that people can help. One, uh, obviously, this is a Bitcoin-focused podcast. Um, I've been into crypto for, for a long time, so I know my way around. But I'm interested in what you and your audience uh, you know, would think is, is interesting crypto policy, because you know, we're going to be coming out with, uh, with the whole crypto policy. So if people can get in touch with me and just sort of let me know, what should I be reading? How should I be thinking about this stuff? Um, very open to suggestions. And, uh, and two, and related, if anyone sort of, you know, thinks this is interesting or would like a actually independent senator who's uh, you know, thinking about these kind of questions we've been discussing, uh, check out my website, blakemasters.com, and uh, people can get involved and, and help out uh, there. So thank you so much for having me today. Yeah, thank you, freaks. If you can help out, do help out. Um, it's been a pleasure. And again, we got a big, big battle in front of us to, to write the ship. And uh, I think we can do it. I think we can do it. We just need to spread these ideas and this common sense and, and get to work. So we'll end it on that. Let's Peace go get it done. Let's, let's get, get it to work. Done. Let's get it done. Peace and love freaks. Take care.